just a, a few words before I uh, get started here. You know, understanding phishing and understanding cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is a very broad category. And uh, the way I usually explain it to folks is that, you know, cybersecurity is, uh, goes a, a mile deep and a mile wide um, as far as breadth. Uh, phishing, we're really going, and, and today we're going to go an inch deep and a mile wide. Um, so it's one uh, kind of a subset of, of cybersecurity, but all of cybersecurity is interrelated in one way or another. If not directly, then indirectly. Again, we're going to have an opportunity towards the end to uh, to let you guys ask questions, or you can ask, you can post in, in the comments at any point, um, and Ray will be uh, moderating those and, and uh, providing you with um, the ability to uh, to for me to answer those questions later. Um, without further ado, let me go ahead and get started. So as you can see from my screen, fishing in the human firewall, uh, we're going to be talking about something we refer to as the human firewall. The human firewall is the last line of defense and really the best line of defense against phishing. Makes sense that we start with, a, with an introduction. So what is phishing, just so that we're clear? Phishing is a form of social engineering. And social engineering really is uh, nefarious individuals preying on either an interaction with you or your goodness or some information they ha may have knowing about you or just uh, you know a, a friendly email, something along those lines. Um, individuals, groups, hackers, there's all different actors that come into play when we're talking about phishing. Um, as you can see there, I've got this stereotypical uh, uh, pre presumably a young person in a hoodie in the war room basement there. That is kind of the, the stereotype of who would be a hacker. But uh, honestly, they, you know, hackers and or nefarious individuals who would do some type of phishing or be involved in it um, could be your next door neighbor. It could be anybody. And that's kind of what's really so scary about phishing is that it really could be happening from anybody anywhere. It's not necessarily limited to uh, you know, attacks that come out of another country or or something else like that. It is could be your next door neighbor, could be um, someone you know you're related to, could be somebody that works uh, in your uh, in your organization. Generally, um, the the folks who are doing the phishing and performing the phishing attacks are intent upon some very specific results. One of the biggest ones is obviously taking your money. Right. So in a lot of cases, you hear about large numbers uh, or large dollars uh, being lost in a phishing attack. Taking your money is the A number one, but it's by far not the only one. Right. So corporate espionage is another one. And you know, we talk about corporate that applies to whether you're a for profit, a nonprofit, doesn't matter. Corporate espionage is another big reason for phishing, finding out. Uh, information or plans or something else like that that would give another corporation or another organization an edge over your organization. In some cases, it's a disgruntled employee, somebody who has a grudge, um, somebody who wants to do wants to, to to get some exact some kind of revenge, either on you or on your organization for whatever reason. Phishing is often an e an email born attack, and I say often because it's not. It's not just mm -hmm. email that uh, phishing it comes through, or no, it's not just propagated through email. And as you're going to see very shortly, there's a number of different ways that um, phishing uh, can take effect, or there's a number of different methods that can be used in phishing. Very rarely is it just an email attack, but it's named for, you know, phishing is named for and known for being an email born attack and usually manifests itself you know, via email because it's a little bit of a faceless medium, right? Very often, although not always, uh, it's sent to large numbers of users or are sometimes power users or individually targeted. So for example, uh, uh, it, you may see something coming from a CFO of an organization or a CEO organization with some urgency saying, please do this right away. And very often it's a you know wire transfer, a large sum of money and do that in the next 10 minutes. Don't ask me any questions. It, most people would look at these and go, you know, uh, yeah, that's not, that doesn't seem right. Or pick up the phone, call that CFO or that CEO or something like that. But 
Um, again, that's why it's sent to often sent to large numbers or sent to large numbers of different organizations or attacked in the same way because they're going to play on on the statistics of that. We'll get if we send to a thousand, we'll get one, something like that. <clears throat> they're attempting to fish. That's why it's called fishing, right? It's like uh, sending out a playing out a hook and waiting for you to buy it on. They're attempting to fish sensitive information by posing as reputable sources. The end result of phishing, and we're going to get into this in another minute or two, the end result of, of phishing is usually what folks see, right? The, the last email that somebody where somebody requests or spoofs um, a, a person of influence to the person who writes the checks or something like that sends us, they, they send a spoof email, hey, send a, a send a wire transfer, X amount of dollars. It, when it's all said and done, the last thing you see, and really a lot of times the only visible component is that last email, the final thing that that pushed, or that, that uh, you know, motivated somebody to take an action or to write a wire transfer or something like that. But very often what's not seen is everything that leads up to that. Rarely is it just a single email that somebody sends and whoops, somebody, you know, follow that email and uh, all of a sudden we're out of a, a large amount of money. So how does it work? I'm going to talk a little bit about how it works here. So as I, I, I alluded to before, there are multiple methods. Very often in most phishing attacks, at least the successful ones, it's not just an email attack. Although very often or almost always, I would say, email is involved to some degree, but it can start via phone. Those weird phone messages that you get. Um, sometimes they have a little bit more meaning than just somebody getting the wrong, um, getting the wrong uh, 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 number or something like that. Your bank um, getting a phone call from your bank saying something strange that sounds suspicious, like uh, you, you, uh, we may need you to change your password or something like that. Those strange things that banks say they'll never do. It sounds very convincing. You may get a, a call from them, but that may be how somebody is trying to gather information or something along those lines. As well as again, email. Obviously, email is uh, is what it's really known for. There are quote unquote phishing attacks that happen that don't happen via email, and they're referred to as other things: vishing, smishing. But we'll get into those in a in a minute or two. But email is one of the most prevalent prevalent forms, and almost and appears in almost every uh, phishing type of attack. Snail mail. So I, I don't know about you folks. Uh, I'm sure it's the same thing, but I get just a ton of junk mail. Um, and occasionally I'll get mail that uh, seems like it's too good to be true or something that's very urgent that we'll have to open. And oftentimes that is part of a larger scheme uh, or a scam to to get you uh, involved in maybe a, in, that involves some type of phishing. I get a follow up email from them later on or something along those lines. But snail mail can also be involved. Or the scariest part, which is direct contact. Now, direct contact can come in a number of ways. Could be somebody who opens the door for you at your office. Could be somebody who you actually know or have known your whole entire life or, or even somebody who works inside your organization. Very often though, the actor or either the actor themselves, the, the person who's doing the phishing or doing the scamming or the, the group that's doing the scamming is involved with somebody who is inside the organization or somebody that you know. Or, as in most cases, it can be a combination of all of the above. And a lot of them are very subtle, such that you would never know it, right? And that's the idea that the hackers have. Hackers, again, are often someone who is familiar, even if it's not the hacker who's someone familiar, it may be somebody who is compromised or even who has been a victim of a phishing attack and doesn't know it might be unwittingly providing information about your organization or something like that. Attacks are very strategically planned and executed. There, I think there's a, you know, from a lot of folks that I talk to, there's a, a misconception that these attacks are, um, are, are you know, like I'm a small organization, you know, no, but there's no reason to, to, to attack us. I mean, we're not a target. That's absolutely 100% categorically not true. Um, as a matter of fact, smaller organizations have been found to be more often and more susceptible a target because they usually have less defenses in place 
and are, are paying attention less to things like phishing or hacking or cybersecurity. And these attacks are absolutely 100% strategically planned and executed. So if you're a target, somebody has deliberately targeted you, right? But you're not alone because uh, there, as you're gonna see in statistics, mm-hmm. everybody can be a target. Some of the common techniques, and we're gonna talk about some of these uh, more common techniques, but um, and they do, I will say that, you know, that, you know, so we're in the IT world and in the IT world, we pride ourselves on two things, really cool names for things and acronyms. So there's some really cool names who have come out of these. Some of these speak for themselves, pretexting, uh, water holing, honey trapping, spear phishing. We talked about some of the direct attacks on like a CEO or something like that, hitting a power user that's uh, spear phishing with a specific, maybe a specific topic that, you know, somebody's really into soccer or something like that. And it would be a specific topic to a specific person. Uh, 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 water holing, baiting, but there are a number of, and these are just, this is just a sample of some of the more interesting names for those things, but there's many, many, many techniques. We'll give you a simple example. So uh, uh, imagine Office 365. A lot of us are using Office 365, and Google Gmail, Google Apps for Work, Google Workspace. Uh, I know that's changed names a couple of times, but Office 365 or Microsoft 365, in this example, occasionally, you will get emails from Microsoft 365 or from your administrator. In this case, in a very simple example, a a convincing looking email with the Microsoft logo and a link to the terms of use policy and privacy notice, just like Microsoft would do, would get sent to you with a simple link in it that says, go ahead and click here to do something really, really important like enabling encryption. In this case, uh, all outbound messages will be placed on hold. There's an urgency. So you're going to find a couple of common threads. First of all, there's always going to be an urgency in these in these emails. So, um, and we'll get to some of the steps as to how you can protect yourself and be aware and things to look for in a little bit as well. But there's always going to be urgency in there. That urgency is going to be followed up with, wait, there's a solution here. All you have to do is click here and do something. So it's a call to action, um, a, a, a sense of urgency, and a very realistic looking request. Thereafter, you can click, click on that click here link and you can go to a, a web page that looks, for those of us who use Microsoft 365, mm-hmm. eerily similar, if not exactly the same looking sign in page. Once you get there, in, very, in, in a lot of cases, now, you know, us Office 365 users, we reach a page that looks exactly like this on a daily basis, often multiple times. So this does not seem suspicious at all if you're not aware for what, of what to look for. This does not seem suspicious. It's kind of a normal, everyday occurrence that this would come up. People would put their email address in, and then after that, it would prompt them for their password, and then all of a sudden, Before you know it, you have just given your email address and password to a hacker. This might be step one, step five, or the end game of a phishing example, but this is a great example of how how a lot of folks get caught in phishing. They give away their credentials, thinking they're just plugging it into a legitimate website. Very often happens like this. Some statistics. And uh, and I know I'm going to fumble. For some reason, the the word statistics seems to stick with me very often. So if I say it very clearly in an odd fashion, that's why. So bear with me. In in, uh, in the past five years, there's been a 67% increase in security breaches. Now, factoring in the the, the last two years, there has been, that is an, an inordinate, uh, increase that the, the the five years prior to that there was not such an increase, but the pandemic may have quite a bit to do with it. Not just uh, the the urge for prying on pe- playing on people's panic over the the pandemic, as well as the fact that teams are working from home largely for the last two years and having to relearn what security is and how to handle security. Um, according to the FBI, uh, criminals have stolen $12 billion from from companies over a five-year span. That's a pretty big number, right? 
Um, and these uh, these uh, attacks happen in large increments. Nobody is uh, really looking for a hundred dollars. Nobody else looking. Not to say that not a hundred dollars is not a lot of money, but uh, these types of criminals are looking for tens of thousands, maybe random looking numbers like one hundred and twenty six thousand two hundred forty three dollars and seventeen cents is owed on a bill and uh, your electricity and everything else is going to get shut off or something like that. But these type of exploits are fairly standard in the six figure amount. So there's a, a lot of money at stake there. An attack is occurring, a phishing attack is occurring on average every 39 seconds. 91% uh, of these successful data breaches started with a spear phishing attack. Now remember, it's not a full frontal assault. And these folks are smart. They're putting together very creative things that are going to fool you. That is the part of the social engineering really that comes in is that it's intended to fool you. They're not going to throw the same thing at you every time. And it's going to be as close to him, as close to home as possible to make it as, as successful as possible. So those spear phishing attacks, again, are a direct attack or, or attack directed at either somebody or a group who can have influence or can provide that information to, that the hacker knows can provide the information to them that they need or that they know they have identified there's a weak link there that they can exploit. But 91% of all successful data breaches have started with a spear phishing attack. That's a pretty big number. So all other uh, you know, cyber crimes to the side of all data breaches, that's how they start. On a daily basis, just kind of put it into perspective here. 156 million phishing emails are sent every day. It's quite a few. Around 16 million of them make it through company email filters. And we're going to talk about email filters in a, in a minute because I'm sure a lot of you are spinning thinking right now, okay, there's got to be a technology solution to this. There is a multi-part solution. We'll be talking about that uh, very soon. But Roughly 16 million of them still make it through the company email filters. Around half of those, so about 8, 8 million of those, get opened by recipients. So we're opening 8 million phishing emails a day, which means you, me, everybody, we're opening, we're opening, at some point we're opening a phishing email. And in the end, about 80,000 people per day end up being victims of phishing attacks, whether that is, and that includes uh, exploiting data or information, which may lead to a, a monetary phishing attack or giving away that, that corporate information or organizational information or something like that. Those scary, those, 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 those uh, um, numbers are a little bit, a little bit scary. So I think it's probably worthwhile talking about what should you do as a phishing victim, right? Um, there are, there are a number of steps. Now, this is not intended to be the end all be all um, of, of how to handle these. There's not a perfect solution, but there are a number of things that you should do. And there are, again, there's some additional steps beyond this, but in the scope of this conversation, I tried to pick the, the top items, the most important items that, uh, that you can take, the, the, the best steps you can take. So first of all, we'll talk about reactive steps, and we're going to talk about some proactive steps because being proactive is really the only uh, um, the only way you can you know, attack this effectively. Reactive means you've been a victim, right? So as a victim, first steps is you want to notify your IT partner and your team, right? Um, uh, your your everyday user, uh, non IT user, even your everyday not uh, 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 yeah, IT staff user. You may not realize that, but uh, cybersecurity is a is a specialty within IT. And I know as IT folks, we're often in in ungrateful for it. We're given the benefit of the doubt that we know everything about every aspect of IT. Generally, your IT partner and your IT, your IT team, if you have internal folks, are going to have some knowledge about uh, cybersecurity. Maybe even in particular vi uh, phishing, and there as well, they're going to understand. Um, they're going to understand how to, um, you know, be preventive and, and, and handle some of these tax. But you're going to notify your IT team and partner. If they're not experts on that, they're going to be able to know who to reach out to next. But as an organization, you're going to want to report the scam 
to the proper authorities. I saw somebody said that, you know, had asked the question, isn't law enforcement doing something about these tax? Uh, yes, they will. Absolutely. What most people don't realize is that there are some very big and oh, yeah, there you go. Thank you, Ray. There are some very big organizations and you're going to recognize them in, in a couple of seconds. You're going to recognize them very clearly that are very serious about these things. Right. Um, a lot of times we're looking for immediate gratification, get my money back, find this person and lock it up so I can be a, that is not necessarily going to happen immediately, but it's super important to uh, express these things and report these things to law enforcement because they can't do anything if you don't do that. The chances of them catching somebody like, like most other crimes, unfortunately, is a, a lower percentage than we'd want to be, a much lower percentage than we want to be. But the more we report, the more they can identify patterns, the more they can identify techniques that'll help us in the future. So by reporting, we're, we're being good citizens. I know that doesn't feel good when you've, when you've been you know, subject to a scam and lost a lot of money or something along those lines, or you've been a victim, but it is helping to um, prevent this in the future, as well as there still is a possibility they may be able to catch somebody and or recoup some of your loss. First one is you always go to your local or state police. Now your local police probably are gonna refer you to your state police, but I would start there. I've, I've dealt with some localities that do have a, a, a cyber crimes or a white collar crimes type unit, usually with a bigger, uh, you know, with a with the bigger departments, you're you're going to see those. So, you know, for those of folks who live around uh, North Carolina, um, you know, Holly Springs Police, um, they're a, a fine organization. They're probably not. I can know for a fact they're not going to have a, a cyber crimes unit, nor are they going to have like a cyber crime someone who does specializes in cyber crimes. The smaller towns and things like that, police departments know, but still reach out to them. They'll guide you and provide you with some other in information, but more than likely you're going to end up with as a first step, talking to the state police. And if you're in North Carolina like we are, that's the State Bureau of Investiga Investigation. Although I have, I've, I've had some tangential interactions with the SBI. Um, those folks are highly trained. Um, they're tech nerds just like us, so they're really into technology. They're very, very smart folks, and they're law enforcement. They're very serious about doing whatever they can to help you, um, as well as um, as well as to you know build this book, this profile, whatever they can to to uh, help eliminate those types of things. So SBI, and I've I've included also some links here, and we can share these. Um, as well later on. But if you get a chance, maybe jot these down. I've shortened these links so that you can uh, write them down if you need to. NC State Bureau of Investigation is a, is a great place to start. Federal Trade Commission. Um, most, most people don't think of it in, in, this, in these terms, but the FTC has, and I'm going to show, actually show you these websites just so you can get an idea of what they look like, because oddly enough, there are some cyber scams out there where um, if you type in the wrong URL, you may end up at a nefarious site when you're actually looking for like the State Bureau of Investigation site. But uh, the Federal Trade Commission, uh, FTC handles identity theft and they have a great tool for uh, being able to report this stuff. Although you're not, this is not what you would think of per se as identity theft, feel free to report to the Federal Trade Commission is going to give you another avenue to report. You're not likely to hear back from the Federal Trade Commission unless there is something that meets a pattern of something they're investigating, but there's always a chance, so it's always worthwhile uh, reporting that. And the big one, the FBI. The FBI is the, the top number one worldwide mm -hmm. uh, white-collar crime investigation uh, uh, unit, and it is their um, Internet Crime Complaint Center. And they have a really simple online tool that you can submit. Uh, and, and all these folks have like an online form. You fill out the online form and submit it. In some cases, we've heard that, in, as a matter of fact, I would say in a, in a startling large number of cases where we've had, we've been involved and we've worked with uh, teams that have submitted to the FBI, they've heard back from the FBI. So the FBI is, you know, the, the SBI, the, the State Bureau of Investigation, or if you're in another state, your state police's white collar crimes unit or internet crimes unit, as well as the um, ICCC for the FBI. Those guys are very, this is what they do all day, every day. They want to hear from you. So there's a lot of steps you can take there. 
And in some cases, they've even helped to recoup some of that money, whether it was through a lawsuit or something like that, right? So you're not helpless. It's not that you just take your lumps and move on and hope it doesn't happen again. Definitely report that stuff. Disconnect the devices until the full nature of the attack is understood. Now, your IT partner or your team or your IT person is probably going to tell you something similar to this. Does that mean shut down business? No, by, by no means am I saying that. And this, take this with a grain of salt. The safest thing to do is until you have a grasp or an understanding of the attack, what was compromised and what machines or services you have that may be compromised, the safest thing to do is just stop. Disconnect things, make a determination and follow some of these other steps here until you can be a little bit more reasonably uh, um, sure that you were safe in turning things back on and resuming your know, normal everyday activity. When you do, right, and, and this may be if you disconnect your devices, it might be for five minutes, might be for 10 minutes, that is probably going to help you to just clear your mind, give you some time to talk to somebody, get, get another opinion, but give yourself at least enough time to figure that, okay, we have to scan everything with some kind of anti-malware solution that's antivirus. There are other solutions like Malwarebytes. Uh, Malwarebytes anti-malware, it's a free download. Um, and uh, you can, you can it'll scan your system to find out if anything is infected, things along those lines. Again, your IT partner and team is gonna be able to guide you as to where to go with this. Um, if you don't have an IT partner or a team, find one. We're absolutely willing to help, uh, and there's, there's there's tons of really good resources, but at least um, having a professional be able to guide you through this is the key. Update all of your passwords. Now, nobody wants to hear this. It's painful to update all of your passwords, but let's go back to that example, that simple example I gave of a spam attack, or I'm sorry, of a, of a phishing attack via email. Somebody sends that very official looking uh, Office 365 email with urgency and a call to action. And you click on that call to action, you've now given somebody or somebody in your organization may have given somebody <clears throat> your password to a single email system, right? In some cases, you have, you'll use that email address to connect to your bank, to connect to your, even to, as a backup for your personal email or vice versa. You may have plugged in your, somehow your, your personal email may have been hacked or compromised. Now all of your systems are compromised because the number one way to reset your password and or to get into all of your other systems is how? Via your email address. So if your email was compromised, even if you don't know your email was compromised, or even if you don't suspect your email was compromised or any of your other passwords, change them. It is the simplest thing you can do to protect yourselves. And first and foremost, one of those steps that you take. Just as a little bit of cyber hygiene here, do not use the same username and password for all accounts. I know it's very tempting. I know it makes it very easy. There are things such as password managers. And again, we're just scratching the surface here. There are password manager systems that are secure that can remember those passwords for you that run on all of your devices everything's encrypted and they're very secure and they can remember those for you. So make them as challenging and at minimum, not the same for every single system. If you do get it, so imagine if your, if your email attack or account, you accidentally give away your email password. Somebody has your email address and password and you use that password for every other account, like your bank account and everything else like that. It speaks for itself. Now everybody's got access. They've got access to everything you have. Yeah. Proactive steps. Now, this is the really important part, and this really is what ties into what we're talking about in this whole entire presentation here. First, review your business continuity plan. A word about what this is. So people, some people refer to business continuity as disaster recovery. Others would refer to it as keeping your business up and running, but that's generally what that is. The business continuity is the ability, what the steps you've taken proactively to make sure that your business can stay up and running in the event of a disaster or an attack like this. I'll give you an example. If you have a server, and it's not just limited to servers, but in this example, let's say you have a server on your network and that server has file shares. You've probably heard of ransomware attacks. Ransomware attacks are where through phishing or another method, somebody gains access to your system 
and they, they, they drop a Trojan or a, a virus on your, a, a piece of malware on your network, it encrypts those drives. Some of you on this call may have even been is very, very prevalent, very common, where they will encrypt the entirety of that drive. Now, all of your company's files are on that drive. And there's two ways to get it back. One is to buy a couple thousand dollars in Bitcoin and then, and then pay off the, the users. Not an option. Do not do that. That just, that just makes you an, an open target for attack and all kinds of other problems with that. The second option is that if you have a very good business continuity plan in place and you've been doing what we call clone level backups of those important resources, you can just uh, um, you can just back or I'm sorry, you can restore. Sorry, that was the word I was looking for. You can restore all of those files to the latest point they had. You may lose a, a small amount of data, but nothing usually that can't be recreated and in a much quicker time, and we're talking about minutes, you're back up and running, and then you can resume with the rest of your plan. So business continuity is really important, but business continuity is a proactive step. You don't think about that at only after you've, it doesn't help you after you've been, uh, after you've been a victim. It only helps you not become a victim in the first place or not become a victim again. Implementing email protection. Again, one of the, you know, so everybody asks, what's there have gotta be technical steps we can take. There is no single push button solution, unfortunately, when you're talking about security. Think of security as an onion. The center of the onion is the soft, sweet part of that that you wanna protect. That's the good stuff. That's your data. That's your, that's your company's integrity. That's your brand name. Those are the things that you wanna protect. Around that, you would build layers, right? So you would build layers around, each layer would be a security measure. The more layers you have around that onion, the more the, the better protected it is. But there's no one layer that's going to fully protect that. Im implementing email protection is a thick layer. That's the one technical layer, really, you can take. Uh, is a thick layer that's going to help you uh, 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 prevent help prevent you from re actually receiving some of those phishing attacks in the first place. Now, is it perfect? No, there is no again. There's no perfect solution. Mm -hmm. I can't overemphasize that. But Without it, every email, every phishing email in the world that ever comes your direction is going to get to it. It's going to make its way to your email box. And we're going to talk about some of those email protection systems in a minute. And the, and the last one is build and train the human firewall. We're going to explain uh, next what the human firewall is, right? The, the very last and very best line of defense is the human. Just remember, although these are these these attacks are taking place via technology and it's technology is more often than not the medium again it might be snail mail or somebody you know or something like that but a lot of the deliver almost all of them are are, um, are 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 carried over some method some uh, form of technology these are attacks on humans not attacks on technology these are attacks on humans when we train the humans and the humans are aware enough of what to do and how to do it, then you've really, that's really the only uh, method of the best and only method of protection, final firewall that you need. Okay? Is that perfect? Again, no, there's no perfect solutions, but we're trying to get as close as we can to that perfection. So let's talk about the human firewall. Um, the, again, there's no sing, single silver bullet solution. At a minimum, you want to accept reality. Everyone's a target. It, especially smaller organizations and companies. If you don't have much money, anybody who commits any kind of commerce or interactional person, uh, uh, interactional, uh, personal interaction or anything like that, if you're an organization, even as an individual, you are a target. So just clear it out of your mind if you think they're not going to attack you because they're attacking you already. On the, on the technical side, use a reputable cloud email provider. If you're in business, there are great tools available, but you've got to be using business email. I know it's tempting if you're very small to use it, just a Gmail address or a like a Hotmail address, one of those free email addresses, especially to keep the costs down. But what's not provided to you on those by default is any layer of spam or uh, uh, air, email born attack protection. So there's no email protection built into those. They may tell you, but you're not getting even the most basic of business email protection. 
Office 365, Google Workspace. Some of you may have a server, your own server, may host your own server or servers that do your email. You want to do is a, a reputable provider. The cloud email providers are preferable for many reasons other than just um, that they give you uh, the, 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 the simple ability to interact with email protection uh, services. But if you have your own email, if you're, if you're hosting your own email server or something like that, there are still options that you can implement for that as well. A comprehensive spam filtering service, AppRiver, Zix, Barracuda, there's a number of them out there. We personally use AppRiver. We prefer that. You know, AppRiver and Zix are the kind of the leading um, uh, entities out there in the, in the email threat protection space. And um, even Zix, so Zix offers an uh, email uh, encryption service as well that we also leverage. All of those lead to, uh, again, it's another layer on that onion, but it's a very important layer that you cannot leave out. Using multi-factor authentication. This is everyone's least favorite thing in the world. Multi I have to pick up my phone. I have to put my, not only do I have to re remember my password, I now have to scroll down and look for where's the code or something else. It's painful sometimes. I get that. And truth be told, there are times when I, myself, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the ones uh, along with uh, like our engineering and security manager, we're the ones who are screaming the loudest about guys. This is the most basic thing you can do. Multi-factor authentication comes built into everything. Even if it's just sending you a text message or, or, or sending you an email to verify, although that's not necessarily the best, but any kind of multi-factor authentication, use it. It's going to get you out of more jams than you can imagine. That multi-factor authentication, for example, gets you out of having accidentally, whoops, given somebody your email password. Remember that earlier simple example? If multi-factor authentication is enabled on your account, somebody else accessing your account, even with the password, still can't get in. Awareness, this is the big one. Build that human firewall, train yourself and your staff to identify phishing. And to do that, let me ask, so what do I do? How do I do that? It's, it, I don't know cybersecurity. You partner with a cybersecurity security awareness and engagement system. Let's start with, look, you know, we're IT people, so of course I'm going to be saying, look, you need a good IT partner to start with. In general, whether it's cybersecurity related, whether it's keeping, you know, the keeping the lights on and, and, and the blinky blinky lights blinking in the right sequence and everything working like it should so that your people who do business can go back to, you know, doing business and not worrying about the technology. But partnering with a cybersecurity awareness and engagement system. Any of any uh, good IT partner is also going to be partner to be able to provide you with um, a, a, a partner or handle that for you themselves that provides cybersecurity awareness. And the systems themselves are very simple. And I can, I'm gonna show you in a minute, uh, we partner with several of these, one of them, no before, one of, that's one of the more prevalent ones that we use. Wombat Technologies for much larger organizations, now Proofpoint, um, they do uh, a very good job. They will actually do this cybersecurity awareness and training for you. Uh, and Weber Security Awareness is another one that we use as well. With all of these systems, right, security awareness training, there's a really simple concept, right? You fish. So in other words, you can't tell where your weaknesses are if you don't prod for those weaknesses. So think of it as a, a, a penetration testing for email. You actually send with the system, you'll actually set up and send a phishing email to all of your users. You don't tell them. In this, you're analyzing who clicks, who gives away their password, um, who is a uh, who is an issue. And then after that, once you've announced them, hey guys, there's no shame in this. I've been caught in those in those kinds of scams myself. I've clicked on some of those emails. They're very good, very tricky. You know, the the most savvy of users can get caught in those. Then the system also provides online automated training. And the entire process is automated for you so that you don't need to understand it. Your IT partner can handle setting it up for you. If you have some savvy IT people or non-IT people who are, are tech savvy, they may be able to handle it for you as well, but the system handles it uh, by itself. It'll send a baseline phishing test. It'll send that actual phishing test. And it'll use something that's really, really been successful. Um, it'll analyze those results for you, notify the users, 
and then schedule that online video training and usually do that monthly or quarterly. Now, depending on your organization, quarterly is usually su sufficient. Uh, in some cases, you know, for folks who it's a little bit tougher to get training done, um, or you've got folks who are, you may even have volunteers. Um, you've got to train everybody. They've got to be involved in it. So even if you can get away with it semi-annually or annually, then that's better than not doing it at all. <clears throat> okay. I also have, uh, so I've got another minute or two um, where I can show you some actual so actual no before uh, this, this is their uh, interface. So here you've got the dashboard for no before, right? And I'll show your organizations your score risk history. Ideally, you want to get this down into the green, right? This is fake data. It's not a real data, but uh, down into the green. Um, and to do that, so you could create a phishing campaign. And this, again, this is stuff that Azure IT provider is something like we would handle this for all of our clients as well. Um, create that phishing campaign. It sends out to all of your, uh, all of your users. You can uh, select the templates or you can modify those templates to look exactly like you want them to. And then follow it up with an automated training campaign. And in addition to that, and that part of the training campaign provides online videos. And there are hundreds upon hundreds that are offered. This service itself, just to give you an idea, right, uh, runs in the range of 25, let's say 25 to $50 per user per year. So it's a very cheap proposition as far as expense that really provides you with a great benefit. And it's not just phishing security. So you've got um, document disposal, um, specific training for CEOs, or pass how to do passwords. So you can do as much or as little, at, if you want to do the minimum, um, you can do as much as you want to. And it's not just limited to phishing training. And it's a great, uh, it's a great, um, service to and great and, and very affordable service to use. Just wanted to touch on a couple of the before I finish up and see if there's any additional questions we have. Um, so we uh, the, this is the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation, the, the SBI. Um, your state will have an official one as well. You can Google that. Just make sure that you're looking in the uh, so uh, in the in the URL uh, that it's uh, it's reputable and when you call that you're asking you can maybe ask for badge numbers or some kind of kind of bona fides to make sure that that's who you're actually talking to the federal trade commission it's identity theft gov is the url and although again it's you're not it's not directly identity theft this is a form of identity mm -hmm. theft as you drill through this and you get started they will give you um they will give you um the the, the option to say this is a phishing or a cybersecurity scam or you can also browse through some of those recovery steps there, right? They do have a lot to do with, uh, this is very helpful if you want to, uh, some additional information on this. And finally, here's the uh, FBI's ICCC or IC3, they call it, Complaint Center. And you can file a complaint. Now it's you know federal government, so it's not the most beautiful looking website, but it is and super useful and very, they've actually made it very, very easy to use, right? Um, so. That is the uh, that is the conclusion of my presentation.